Good evening, church. It truly is a blessing once again to be in the house of the Lord, once again to uh, teach God's word on this Wednesday night at Bible class of good news. Scripture says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So we praise God for his goodness and his mercy. We pray that everyone did, went out yesterday and did his civic duty and you voted. As we said on last week and uh, just remind us that especially as an Afro-American people, we have, anybody have a reason to go out there and to vote is us for this. One of the privilege that many have sacrificed their lives, dogs we put on them, hard water holes on them, just because they wanted to vote to get their voices heard. So if you didn't, but pray, if you didn't, I'm not here to put a guilt trip on you, but to do pray that things that are going on now will bring glory and honor to our God who is faithful. And once again, we want to, uh, Get right into the word of God today. We're going to start off with prayer. We're going to pray for whoever got elected, whatever proposition did get in, and those who didn't, that we know that God's will will be done. And I always like to go back to Second Chronicles when it says, If my people, which talk about God is not looking for the world to come from his people, those who accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and believe that he is a sovereign God, that he's in control. He said, If my people would humble themselves, would see that, uh, show that we are totally dependent upon him. Without him, we could do nothing. He said that we could uh, humble ourselves and pray, turn from our wicked way, have a repentant heart. In other words, we do a self-examination before we go into the time of prayer. And then turn from our wicked way and repent. Then we would hear from heaven and he would heal our land. So God is looking for us as his people to set the precedent to come before him in a time of prayer. The Bible said the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And for those who are praying with us on our uh, Wednesday, uh, Friday nights, uh, we'll be praying for different issues. And this week we'll be praying for the restoration that Lord will bring just restoration in our lives, in our churches, in our homes, and in our country. And what could think of a better subject that to be praying for for him. So let's open up with a word of prayer now, and then we'll go before the Lord. Eternal God, our Father, Lord, we thank you. We praise you tonight, Father, for once again an opportunity to come into your presence, Father. We don't take it lightly, Father. We realize, oh Lord, you are holy God, and we're sinful people prone to wonder. But because of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father, you said if we confess our sins, he will be faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Father. So forgive us, Father, for the things that were hindered from our prayer. And you said if we have iniquity in our heart, you do not hear us. So, Father, cleanse us right now and fill us with your spirit, that even as we pray now, Father, that you'll be able to use your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Help us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. All right, as we know, we're booking the book of Romans, and we have went through the first chapter. We're in the second chapter now, and I won't go over that, but we know that for those that um, have been studying with us. It's been said that if you miss out on your theology in the book of Romans, that means that you would have uh, a messed up theology. In other words, uh, what you believe is how you live. So if you need to really take it to heart the things he's saying here, because one of the things he tells us exactly who he is, who we are, what Christ has done, and then give us the power of just, and the theme of the book is. Faith, righteousness, faith, righteousness, that we are justified, justified by faith uh, and we declare it righteous by what Jesus Christ has done for us. So, uh, which we talked about this, we are talking about it and in this, uh, in, for starting from the first chapter, verses 18 through actually going all the way into the end of the second chapter, we see the wrath of God. And how the wrath of God is revealed when we talked about it. We said from 18 to the uh, 33rd verse of the first chapter. Uh, and I use an analogy that Dr. J. Vernon McGee, he talks about three types of sinners in the first part of Book of Romans. The first chapter from 18 to the 33, he called that the reckless sinner. For those who knew God but did not want to own him as God and didn't want to acknowledge him as God, then he tells us that we we are without excuse. And those who are living a riotous life, that living like you know life like they don't really care. Then we start off. We're talking about in the second chapter where we start start talking about last week. 
<coughs> excuse me, was we, we were talking about the, the, the respectable sinner. And these right here, we said that now, whether you are a reckless sinner, when you're living in your life, like God doesn't exist, you're doing whatever you want. And say God just gave him up to be a reprobate mind. Uh, that means that reckless sinner and the respectable sinner are those that they're sitting there looking out their window and saying, I'm so glad I'm not like them, but not realizing that you know, whether you are a reckless sinner or a respectable sinner, you are still a sinner. And we'll talk about the religious sinner. Maybe we don't get it tonight, but we'll talk about it maybe next week. But tonight we want to sit to talk about more or less some of those that we're dealing with here in this whole second chapter talking about the respectable sinner. And we see the respectable sinner talk comes from the second chapter of Romans, verses 1 through 16. And the respectable means, uh, yeah, they're still sinners. It's just that they don't live their life as just in blatant sin like others, like they don't care. Uh, but these are the people who are sitting there and put look at, put other folks down, put themselves uh, be above people and saying, look, I'm so glad I'm not like them. But whether you're not doing what they're doing, we're still sinners. Unless you have put your faith in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, repented of your sins, then you are still a sinner. But once you accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you no longer are called a sinner, you're called saints. And we find that over in the book of Ephesians, he says that we're those who are faithful in Christ, and he called us saints. Now, a saint is one that are called set apart for God's use. It don't mean that you are perfect, sinless in any respect. It's just that you have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. So now then we talked about in the respectable sinner, we said that there are six things that God judged respectable sinner about. And we talked about last week was first is the knowledge of God. That other word, even though they uh, was a, wasn't living a riotous life, they're living any kind of sin, but they had knowledge of God's word. And he was speaking to this to the Jews because the Jews were boasting that they had the word of God. But let me tell you, much is given, much is required. Like all of us, especially those that are saved today, that uh, but yet we want to continue living live in sinner and put our life that like we're better than others. You're going to be judged based on the knowledge that you have of God's word. Ignorance to the word of God is no excuse. You're still a sinner. Secondly, we deal with the truth. Now, we know what the word of God tells us, that Jesus said, I am the what? The way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father but by him. So not only do you have knowledge of God's word, of his law, but the truth, knowing the truth, who it is, of Jesus Christ. You'll be based on the truth that you know. And it is amazing to me because if we go back, remember in the first chapter, he says the very invisible things in creation speaks of that there is a God. For those who don't want to acknowledge God, you go out and look at the sun, you go look at the moon, you look at the stars out there. They speak of the elements of God. So you know the truth. So you, whether you want to accept God or not, you're going to be judged based on the truth. Right? Because whether, remember I told you, you may not be reckless sinner living like you don't know God and you don't care about God, but you have truth of God's word, you have knowledge of God's word, but yet you are still a sinner. And the third thing that we talked about last week and which we're going to pick up tonight is guilt. Because so often and people know God's word, they know the truth, and they have a knowledge of the word, but they, they, they live like they're no guilt. They're quick at putting other folks down and saying, I'm better than this, but they don't have no guilt of themselves. So this is where we're going to pick up tonight, and it's going to be Romans, the second chapter, verses 4 and 5. And, and, and then we talked about the deeds. Um, I, think, I think I went too far there. I'm going to jump down to, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to guilt. You don't, you're not uh, to guilt. You don't going to have the scriptures there. I'm just going to kind of read those to you and talk about it because I think I deleted them out. But anyway, for those who are following with me, it's in Romans 2, verses 4 and 5. And uh, here's what it says. Just follow with me and bear with me this tonight. It says, Or despisest thou the riches of the goodness and the forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impotent heart, treasure it up unto, unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelations of the righteous judgment of God. Now, what this speaks of here in talking about guilt, this speaks of how God judged on the basis of a person's true guilt. 
If you can uh, know the truth and you know the knowledge of God and you can sin or, or put people down or judge and say, I'm better than others and thinking you're better than others like the Jews were, thinking that because they're a Jew, they're better than the, the Greeks, which is another way of saying those who were out God, they were better. It means that they, they have no truth. True repentance is only comes when you have guilt over your sins against the goodness of God's grace. There are people who sin, but they're not guilty of it. If you can continue to sin and have no guilt, no remorse, then that you are still looked as what we call a respectable sinner. Amen? As Paul is saying to his readers to take, we, that they were taking it for granted that God is long-suffering toward those who are, <clears throat> are sinful. You know, and we're continuing to sin. You know, and this is what I always say about, especially as we as Christians, we take it for granted that God is so loving and so gracious. And because God is so gracious, people that he's not, because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And because God doesn't wipe us out, we'll think it's okay to go ahead and, and, and live in sin or lie or commit adultery or steal and those things because God is not wipe, wiping us out. So what you're doing, you're taking advantage of the grace of God. And a grace of God is what? God's unmerited favor. But what you're experiencing it, you take it for granted, but you will give account. Paul is saying, don't take it for granted because even though they are not, you're not bad and you're not a reckless sinner, you're still a sinner. Amen? And you're still subject to the wrath of God. And I'm just going to read to you of how uh, God uses Israel as a real uh, illustration of how he deals with that. And for those who are following me, you can turn your Bibles to Hosea, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 4. And I'm going to read to you how he get, talks about Israel and how their guilt, they didn't lead to repentance, so they still were subject to it. And he says here, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And they called them, so they went from them, they sacrificed unto Balaam, which is an idol god, and burned incense to the graven image. Talking about the people of God. Had no guilt for it, right? Then he said, I taught Ephraim also to take, to go, taking them by their arm, but they knew not that I had healed them. So in other words, God said, now, they had already been taught that it was wrong for them to worship idol gods, but yet they didn't. He taught them that. He said, I drew them with the cord of a man, with a band of love. And I was I was to them as they did take off the yoke of the, of the jaw and lay meat unto them. They did not feel guilt. Neither did neither did those who live uh, during Noah's day. So in other words, even though God told the children of Israel not to worship idols, they had no guilt about it. So why? Because they were still, what? Sinners. So what he's saying to you and I as believers, if you don't have guilt over your sins and if you don't have no remorse and want to repent of it, chances are that you don't really know God. Yes, you may have knowledge of God. You know who he is. You know the truth that Jesus Christ is the truth. But if you have not repented and there's no guilt of it, you're still lost in your sin. And remember, God brought judgment, the wrath of God, on the people for 120 years. Noah preached uh, for them, that it was going to rain, but they did not repent, and we know. But see, they they all they felt no remorse for their self condition, but became even more rebellious toward God. More Noah preached that you repent because it's going to rain. They got worse, which is what Paul is saying here in Romans two and five. But after the hardness and the impenitent heart, they treasured up to thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So what he's saying there, there, this is where sin hardens a person's heart towards God. And I'm going to pause for a moment because this is what happened. We talked about it in the New Testament. It says we have callous. You know, if you live in sin alone after a while, especially even if you name yourself as a Christian, you get callous in your heart. You think it's okay. You ever did work and you had callous on your hand and get so callous and then you really don't feel it? That's what happens when you, can, you know the truth. You know the knowledge of God's word, but you continue to live in sin after a while. You start thinking it's right. You have no guilt. 
And what happens is you bring in the wrath of God onto yourself. That's why it's a dangerous thing to think that because you don't indulge in sin like others, that you're any better than them. Well, look at here. I'm not a homosexual. I'm not a liar. I don't worship idols. But yet you sit there in judgment on others and look, look at, I don't know why they're still doing this. I'm better than them. It said, you don't have no guilt on that yourself. Why you sitting on judgment? And remember I told you, I think I closed last week and I said, why you are pointing your one finger at the person out there who's sinning, there's three other fingers pointing back to you and the thumb is pointing back to God. We need to realize that our vertical relationship is just as important as our horizontal. So you need to be right with God yourself and not sit in judgment on other people. Amen? So, And this is what they talk about. So then we come on to the part where those are the third things that we do. We come to the fourth part that we're going to be judged by as far as it's our deeds. Our deeds. And those deeds are where it's taken from. It's right here. It's taken from Romans 2 verses 6 through 10. Now you can catch up with me. Sorry for those who don't have the other scriptures that I have in there. But Romans 2, 6 through 10. And it, and it reads, Who will render to every man according to his deeds? To them who by patient continues in well-doing seek for glory and honor and in immortal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteous indignation and wrath. Amen. And in verse 9, he says, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jews first and also to the Gentile. Now look back, we go back, we're talking about the deeds now. We already know that uh, whether you uh, you not be a regular sinner, but a respectable sinner, you're going to be based or not judged based on the truth that you have, the knowledge that you have, and the guilt of your sin. But here he talks about our deeds. So I'm going to go back again. Look what he says here, according to the deeds. Now he said, who will render to every man according to his deeds? And let me say this here. Now he's talking to people here that are saved, and then there are those who are not saved in his place. He said, to them who by patience continues in well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. Talking about what they're seeking in their own power. But he said, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteous indignation and wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So that lets us know that none of us are without excuse. We're all going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ. But what it is makes it simple here. We come to the point here. This is a simple and straightforward passage of scripture that we all will be judged according to our deeds, whether we're good or bad. And let me say that here. And I think I talked about it a little bit in the last week. I said there is two judgment. There is what we call the great white throne judgment are those who uh, blatantly reject Jesus Christ as the Son of God. They continue to live in sin. That means that they will be judged, and they will go into the lake of fire. And at the end, the lake of fire will be cast into. Then there are those, what we call the Bema Seat of Christ, where it talks about it. It says that, that we all should stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We, and we would, it said, it's a punishment on the man to, once to die, and after that, the judgment. Amen. So in other words, we will be judged, even as Christians, before the deeds that we do in our body, whether they're good or evil. In other words, there is no excuse for none of us to continue to live in sin. Amen? And this is what he said, by your deeds, whether it was good or bad. And this should be nothing new to us today because we all have read what it says in Revelation. And follow with me because this is where the rubber meets the road. Here, it says here, in Revelations, uh, Actually, this is not Revelation. This is still the passage of Scripture. It says, But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and to the Gentile. But then when he goes to in Revelations, he speaks to us and speaks to reason why a straightforward way to let him know that we're going to give an account. Look what he said. And I read this all the time at funerals to let people know how we stand. He said, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open." And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things written in the books. And they right here, the dead. When he talking about that, not only those who are alive, but those who are died without Christ and those who died with Christ, it will be judged. He said, according to what? 
Here it is, the deeds, their works. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in them, and the dead and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. In other words, brothers and sisters, there you will not get away with the deeds that you are do, doing in, in your body. So it said, the Jews knew this because it was taught in the Old Testament. Also, and it taught them, for you know, those who want to research it in their own time, you'll find, read Isaiah 3, verses 10 through 11, and Jeremiah 7 through 10. But uh, Paul speaks of two deeds, those of the righteous and those who are the unrighteous. The righteous are the unredeemed, are, the, are not doing it for themselves. But in other words, there are people who are in Christ. Everything they're doing is for the what? They're not doing it for, their, for the glory of God. They're doing it for their own work. You know, there are people who uh, serve God. They give. They, they worship. They serve in the church. They do all things. But are they doing it for the glory of God? No, they're doing it for themselves. Are they doing it what we call a works righteousness? They're doing it because they're trying to merit something of God, not out of a true heart. And it's not saying that we're not, not saying we're not to work, but you don't work to be saved. But you work because you are saved. Amen? And look what he says here in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10 and 31. It says, for you and I that are here today. And it says here, whether therefore whether there, therefore you eat or whether you whatever you do, you do all to the what? To the glory of God. So it doesn't matter what you eat, what you do. And sometimes we sit in judgment on people where I, I eat pork and they don't. I don't drink alcohol, but they do. Or I do this and I do that. But if you're only doing it so you can say that how good you are, and if you're not doing it for the glory of God, then you are just what we call a what? Irrespectable sinner, which means that you are still a what? A sinner. Amen. So, and also it tells us that we have there in 2 Corinthians 4 and 17. And the point that I'm getting here is that if you're sitting in judgment on others and you're thinking about how good you are and, uh, and how bad others are, in a long time you're sitting in judgment on others. And we hear the world say, all say don't judge me. God ain't finished with me yet. You know, and even though they say it and it bothers us as Christians, it's a true statement. We don't need to sit on judgment on anybody. The only one that can judge anyone is God. Amen? So Paul says here in uh, 2 Corinthians, Four and seventeen, he says here, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, working for us a four more exceedingly in weight of glory. In other words, the things that we're going on through here, uh, but is for a moment, which works in a pharmacy. The things that we're going through here and we're struggling in our life is to bring us to a point that we will grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we bring a weight for all that we're doing for is not for ourselves, but is for what? The glory of God. And church, it's, it's not for enough us to say what we're doing. And I have to catch myself, you know, I've been through some struggles and health challenges in my life, and I have to remind myself, it's not for me, it's all for the what? The glory of God. We heard Job say, naked I came, naked I leave. Amen. But I uh, said, God gave, God to take away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Let me say this to us here. As you live in your life, everything that we are do, we are do for the glory of God. That's not being taught today. Everybody's in here. Look at me. Look what I have came in. But it's not for you. This brings, we're, this brings honor and glory to God when you're going through something and you realize it's not for you, but it's for the glory of God. But on the other side, this coin is just the opposite. It says up here in Romans 2 and 8 of the same passage of Scripture, the chapters that we're talking about. But unto them that are contentious. I like that. Are contentious. That word contentious means that a person who is all about them, they, they're angry, they sit on the edge, and they do not obey the truth. In other words, they know the truth, they have knowledge of it, there's no guilt of it, and they're contentious, and they obey not the truth. You know it. But you continue to do sin. And I'm a park here for the moment because this is here. And, you know, and coming up in the holiness church for years and brought up and being a holiness preacher, you know, and where we really preach hard against sin. I never forget that as a young preacher. Uh, people used to call me the bone scraper because, you know, I, I, I took no excuses for sin. But God had to one day show me a sin in my own life that actually made me get 
uh, opened my eyes. While I'm sitting here trying to beat people down in the sin they did, he showed me something that was in my life that I need to repent of and get it here. And it, it, brought, it taught me to the point to be more of what? Uh, sensitive to people in their sin. Not thinking I was in better. And this is what Paul said, but unto them that are contentious. These are what these Jews were. They were sitting down looking down on the Gentiles because they had the word of God. They think because they were Jew, they were saved. But he said, and they knew. But here's the thing about it. They had the truth. They knew the knowledge of God, but they did not obey the truth. But obey what? Unrighteousness. In other words, they knew the truth, but they still, they were still sinners. Just because they were Jews don't mean they were saved. He said they were unrighteous. They had indignations and wrath. Meaning they were that what? They were sinners. They were not saved. And the same as you. You sitting there pointing your finger at somebody else, putting past judgment on them. You are no better than they are. And this is what he's saying. I'm going to read this from the ESV because I like the way it reads there. And it's not, it won't be on your screen, but it said, You're not getting by with anything. Every refusal, refu refusal and avoidance of God adds fuel to the fire. The day is coming when it's going to blaze hot and high. God's fiery and righteous judgment. Amen. It says, sorry, make no mistake. In the end, you get what's coming to you. Real life for those who work on God's side, but on to those who insist on getting their own way and take the path of least resistance is fire. In other words, if you don't deal with your sin and stop worried about, like what um, Jesus said, you worried about the speck in your brother's eye and you get I got a log in your own eye, here, you're just as guilty, which you call a wretched, respectful sinner. You're unrighteous, you have indignant and wrath in your heart. And brothers and sisters, this is a dangerous sin for us as believers to sit in judgment on others. Think that you are better than anyone else. For the Bible tells us all have sin and come glory, come for guilt, guilty of the uh, glory of God. In other words, so we're all subject to it unless you come to faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. So just as those who deeds prove their obedience and true repentance brings eternal life, those who are unredeemed reject the grace of God, prove their selfish motives. It's all by them. You know the truth, but you continue to do what God tells you not to do. They're only doing a thing for themselves, not for the glory of God. And this is where it's the thing, because a lot of it, that's the reason why people on Sunday morning, you're coming to the church, you don't see them. They try to sing the songs, but they don't smoke in church. They don't drink in the church. They're not lying in the church. But you get them out, time to get out of church on Sunday afternoon, you would think they would never been in church. They is just as simple as they were. But what happened is, as long as they were in around Christians, they act like Christians. But the moment they got out of the, the presence of those who were supposed to be Christians, they lived like the world. He says here, you're unrighteous. Amen. And you're only doing it to be seen. You're not really doing it for the glory of God. The second characteristic of the unredeemed is that they don't obey the truth. They know it, but they don't obey it. They're rebellious by nature, and they are enemies of God. It's one thing to know the scripture. It's another thing to live it out, brothers and sisters. And this is why he comes up to here and he tells us here in uh, Romans 8 and 7, and it says, uh, it may not be on your uh, passage of scripture here, but it tells us for that in Romans 8 and 7, that those uh, in the flesh can't please God. So you're in the flesh, you're living in the flesh, and if you don't have uh, Jesus, you can't please God. Amen? So, then it brings me to the next point that we talk about. So what? He says, a respectable sinner, you judge based on your knowledge that you have of God's word, you know, of the truth, of who truth is Jesus Christ, of the guilt and how that when you, you know the truth, but yet you don't guilty about it, you don't repent of it, you're going to be judged of that because it don't lead you to repentance. Then the last one is your deeds because you're doing things, but you're doing them out of habit, you're doing them out of duty, but you're not doing them for the glory of God. You are just what you call a respectable sinner to still subject to the what? The wrath of God. You're not a reckless sinner. You're a respectable sinner. Looking out the window, peeping out at other folks, saying, look, I'm so glad I'm better, better than they, when you, in reality, you're just as guilty as they are. Which brings me to the, uh, 
the, the fifth thing is there is impartiality. Impartiality. And that's just taken from uh, Romans, the second chapter, verses 11 through 15. And this is right here. Sometimes we think that, you know, because uh, we're in the church and those are outside the church, we think, but what was happening is Paul was speaking to these Jews. They thought because they were Jews, they was a heretic, that, you know, God's going to deal with them different than going to deal with others. But look what Paul says here in his passage of Scripture that lets us know. For there is no respect. For there is no respect of persons with God. In other words, whether you're Jew, Gentile, whether you're born again or unagain, God is respected. He's going to deal with all of us based on what we know. For he said, for as many as have sinned without the law shall, be, shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Listen to what he says here. For there is no respect of persons with God. Amen. Speaking to these Jews who are in this church. For as many as have sinned without the law shall perish without the law. In other words, just because they don't have the law, the Gentiles didn't have it. But here, they, they, they're going to be judged even without the law. Then he says, as many that have sinned, the many, as many without the law, as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So whether you have it or not, you're still going to be judged based on what you have. Amen. And look what he says in 13. For not the hearer of the law are just before God, but here it is. Just like James said, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For in other words, faith without works is what? It's dead. So it's one thing to know the word of God. It's another thing to live out. God is no respect of a person. Just because you sit in the pew, just because you sing in the choir, just because you're in the pulpit, just because you're doing some service in the church, don't mean that you're not going to be judged. All of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But Paul is making a point here. It's just showing that to these Jews and to the Greek, God is going to judge us all based on the same truth. The knowledge of his word, the truth of God's word, their guilt, and your deeds. And he show you, he's impartial. Amen? That's what he says. So, when he comes here, that impartiality, and he tells us here in verse 14, he says, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves. So the Jews going to be based on judged on based on the knowledge they have in the law. But the Gentile, which they don't have the law, but they do it by nature. They do the things in the law. In other words, there's something inside them. They know right from wrong. Amen. Because of what's inside them. Right. So in 15, he says, which show the works of their law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the means while, meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. Now, this truth here continues to who is under the wrath of God. And here, Paul makes things clear to these that are in Rome. Those who have the law will be judged will not be judged different than those who have not the law. Let me say that again. Those who have the law, other words, who know the word of God, and those who don't have the word of God will be judged the same way. This is what he said. This is the very point. There's no different judgment there. We all have read that he said we're without excuse. So because there's something inside of us that know how to do right or to do wrong, there's no excuse. Further, Peter had a prejudice towards the Gentiles until he witnessed how the Lord was working in the house of Cornelius. Remember that? When the Lord told him to go to Cornelius' house, and Cornelius, in the book of Acts, was a Gentile. But he told him to go into him. But Peter said, no, I won't go into there. But look what it says here in Acts 10 and 32. This is Peter. And I'll show how bold Peter was. And it said, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of person. Peter had to learn because he told him, he said, uh, I remember when he let the sheet down and they had some, uh, I can use this analogy, some pig feet. He had some shrimp and he had some lobster in it. All the things that the Jews would consider as unclean. But Jesus said, if I call something clean, don't you call it unclean? So in this way, so God is not respected of persons. Amen. We all have knowledge of God, the truth of God's in the word. It does not matter with God who you are. 
person here means whether you a person is a means or you're a person that was poor, whether you are high ranking status or you're just an ordinary person. We're all going to be judged based on the knowledge that we have of God's word and what you do with God's word. So don't think you're better than others because you have the word of God. Amen. It tells us over in Galatians, he says here, and, it, and we, we've heard and read this, so this is nothing new to none of us. But what Paul is doing is letting these Jews know, you sitting here judging on other folks, but I want to remind you, you're going to be, uh, be judged from what you know yourself. And if you listen to me today, you're going to be judged. You think you're better than others? You think you're righteous because you're in the church and you're in this and here, and you're sitting on judgment and others? Be why? Because he said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. Talking about those who were Jews and they wanted to get near, sitting on judgment. Then he says here in verse 8, For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall reap life everlasting. So if you are, you live in your life and it's all about you in the flesh, all about the things that you, you're doing something, trying to merit the presence of God, you're doing it to be seen or you're doing it for your own purpose, then that's in the flesh. Remember he told us in the Roman, those in the flesh cannot please God. I don't care how good you sing, you're gifted, but if you're doing it because you want to hear people say how good you sing, here, then that's in the flesh. Or if you're doing it because you want to hear somebody saying, oh, oh, look at how good Pastor Whitehurst preached. That's in the flesh. It's all to be done for the what? The glory of God. Amen. That's the reason he said, he said, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And the only thing that you do for Christ will last. Amen. So there is a difference in the punishment according to the knowledge that one has. Yeah, you you know you know the other word that if you you know the truth but you don't do it but you still be held accountable to it is what he's saying. Jesus gave a parable of the slave and his master. He talks about it here in Luke twelve verses forty seven and forty eight. He said, "And that servant which knew his lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes." Look what he said. That servant which knew his lord's will. In other words. Just like it, you know what God is telling you, but you don't. But you don't prepare yourself. Neither did according to his master's will. Talking about a slave, he knew what the master said, but he didn't do it. He continued to do what he wanted. He shall be beaten with many stripes. And then in forty-eight, he says, "But he that knew him not, talk about that person that did not, and did not commit worthy of strife, shall be beaten with fewer stripes." Because what he didn't know it, right? But he, he did those things that he shouldn't be. He's going to be uh, beaten with what? With fewer stripes because of that. Shall be beaten with fewer stripes. For unto whomsoever, so for whomsoever, ah, for, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, to him will ask of the more. In other words, you're going to be judged on basis of the knowledge you have. Much is given, much is required. You are without excuse. And just in case someone here heard this and they saw it, they still reject God's truth and they still have a greater judgment. There, uh, And this is what here, there are two scriptures I want to read for you as we prepare to now to close. And that first one is Hebrews 4 and 6. And you've heard me talk about this in the last few weeks or quite a few times. Because remember, in the... A Hebrew church, and that's like in the book in Rome, in the Romans church, there were those who were saved. They were in the church of Rome, but they were saved. And there were some Hebrews in the Hebrew church were saved. And then there were those who were in the church uh, of the Hebrew church, but yet, and they weren't saved, but they just liked being around the Christians. They liked singing the songs, and, and but they were not saved. He says here, and look, this is a very strong word. He says here, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Once enlightened means that they have knowledge of the truth. They, the, they have heard the word and have tasted the heavenly gift. They have seen what God done. They didn't ingest it. They have tasted. They, they know what God have done and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. In other words, they have experienced the move of God in people's lives. But yet, look what he said. And have tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come. They have seen what God have done. 
Yeah. But then it says, and so, if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance. In other words, it's, a, it's impossible. What? For if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. See, and they have what? Crucified to themselves the Son of God or friend and put him to the open shame. In other words, they act like they're, they're, Christ didn't die for their sin. They know the truth, but it didn't affect how they live. And brothers and sisters, this is a very strong word because if you can live in sin and don't repent of it and living in there, then chances are you may not be saved. And basically what is here in this church, what it said here in the Hebrew church, and Paul is talking about in the Romans here, these respectable churches, these were unsaved folks. That's, that's an important word for you to get here. And then he goes on, he drops down to, even in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, look what he says here. He said, for if we sin willfully, Listen here, this is talking to you and I as believers and for those who are not. For if we sin willfully, you know it. After that, you have received the knowledge of the truth. In other words, you know what God's word says. You know what the judgment of God is, but you continue to sin willfully. You, in other words, I don't care what God's word says, and you continue to do what you want you want to do, it says here. He says that they're renewing the truth. There remain what? No more sacrifice for sin. Now, let me say this in point. Not saying that there's no more sacrifice. Christ died what? Once for sin and sat down at the right hand of the Father. He's talking about people who have heard it, the truth. They had, a, they, they had knowledge of truth. They had the, uh, there was guilt. They did some deeds and it was not for the glory of God. But they continued to sin willfully. He says, and you do it willfully after you don't know all this. He said, and receiving nothing, there remained no sacrifice of sin. It means that there's no chance. It's, it's too late for you. You've all rejected the, uh, the only means for salvation. And salvation is what? Through Jesus Christ. And this is, is what he is saying to us. And look what he says here in 27. But here it is the result of that. But a certain fearful looking for what? Here it is. Of judgment. And here it is. Fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. The same thing that's going to get Satan is going to the same thing get you. Because you know the truth, but you continue to want to live in sin. Let me say this, brother. That's the reason why we can't play with sin. Sin is not your friend. Amen? But it's not, it don't stop there. Look what he says here. He uses Moses as an example in verse 20. He said, He that despises Moses' law died without mercy under two and three witnesses. In other words, you, they had the law of God talk, going all the way back to the children of that were in the wilderness. They had them, but they died without mercy. God judged them by true and three witness. And in 29, he said, and this is here where it goes, and I love it. I love God's word. And he said, of how much sore punishment shall ye, talking about what? Talking to these Jews here. Suppose ye, shall he not, shall he that thought worthy, who have trodden under the foot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant which have which was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despise unto the Spirit of grace. In other words, you're trampling other words. You know what Christ died for your sins, that but yet you still continue to do it. He said, You're throttling under the Son of God. You put God to the open shame. Oh, and count it the blood of the covenant that he sacrificed is, is unholy. It, it's no good to you. And verse 30 says here, For we know that he that said, This is what God said to those who continue and willfully sins. He said, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. Talking about God. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the people, the Lord judged the people. He will judge his people. In other words, God brought, talking about how he brought judgment on those Jews because they knew the truth, but they were continuing to reject them. Just because you're a Jew don't mean that you are saved. And we're talking about that when we talk about the re respectable sinner. And I think the last one we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to stop right there and we'll get into, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to just finish the last one. You don't have it on your page, but for those that are following me, it's just Romans 2.16. And next week we'll talk about, the last, the last one we're talking about religious sinner. So Romans 2.16, and before we close out the prayer, it said, In the day when God shall judge the secret of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And, and this sixth principle is God's judgment. Whether you are a reckless sinner, a respectable sinner, 
God is not um, a sinner. God is not going to judge you or based on what somebody else say. He's going to judge you what's in your heart. So you can have all the good deeds and you got the knowledge of that. You have no guilt. He's looking at your heart. And who knows your our motive better than God? He giveth more, he he knows us better than we know ourselves. And David said to Solomon in Solomon, 1 Chronicles 28 and 9, he said to Solomon, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. The Lord searches all hearts and understands all the indignations of imagination and the thought. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. For if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Now, this is a very true, a true and a powerful statement that should cause every one of us to examine our heart and motive to whether we are good or bad to know. And I love it what David said. David said in Psalms 139 verses 1 and 3, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my sitting down and my uprising, thou understanding my thoughts afar off. Thou compass my past, my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. In other words, God knows all about you, brothers and sisters. So, what is saying, whether you are a reckless sinner, we talked about in that first chapter, or you got all these knowledge, and you got knowledge of God's truth, you have knowledge, you have the truth, you have this guilt, there's deeds, but you are not doing it for the glory of God, you will be judged. You are what we call a respectable sinner. You're still lost. We'll talk about next week what we call a religious sinner because these Jews thought because they were born of Abraham that they were going to be saved. So whether you are a reckless sinner, as Dr. McGee said, or a respectable sinner, looking out, peeping at and judging other folks, or we're going to talk about it next week, talking about sitting in the church, or you're a religious sinner, you're still a sinner. You need to be saved. And we know that we're saved by what? Grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. It is truly a lamp into our feet and a light into our pathway. We thank you for the Apostle Paul, Father, and how he showed us that no matter whether we're reckless or we're respectable sinners sitting out there, we're all sinners, Father, in the need of a Savior. So, Father, we ask, O oh God, that you would help us, Father, to not look down at others, but look at how that you were so gracious to us and saved us and brought us out of darkness into your marvelous light. So, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would help us, Father, to not be, uh, you say in your word, he that judges himself by himself is not wise. Our judgment is to look at your son, Jesus Christ. But when we look at Christ, we all fall short of the glory of God. So the only way that we can be at peace today is through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. So we ask you, Father, forgive us for being judgmental of other folk, thinking that we're better than others. When it was up wasn't for the grace of God, well, where would we be? So we thank you and praise you, Father, for what you've done tonight. And all God's people said with me, amen and amen. God bless you, God. Keep this my prayer. Remember that uh, to continue to share us and like us on YouTube, um, Facebook, and you can subscribe to us on YouTube. Remember that on Sundays, we are having our in place from worship service at Good News Church at 239 West Washington Place in Pasadena, California. Our service started at 8.30 to 9.45. And I just want to open the door to let you know that on uh, September, I mean, uh, November the 19th, which is a Saturday, two Saturdays from now, the third Saturday of the month, we will be having our Thanksgiving feast at our church where we will be having testimony times and there are those uh, giving uh, thanks, and we'll be having fellowship. All are invited. We should have some good, good music, some good food, and good uh, testimony times about the goodness of God. You're invited. It's going to be 1 o'clock on uh, November the 19th at Good News Church. So until then, God bless you, and God keep you is my prayer. So have a blessed night, and we'll see you on Sunday morning. Have a blessed week.